Pennsylvania House passed its fourth consecutive on time and balanced budget since Republicans took control of the chamber. A budget that contained no tax increases. The $29 billion fiscal bill kept government spending below the rate of inflation and made a record investment in K-12 education in the Commonwealth. Here to discuss the budget with me today is State Representative Ryan McKenzie. Representative, welcome. Anthony, thanks for having me. Now, earlier this year we had you on the program and we spoke about budgets. You correctly predicted that it would be done on time by the June 30th deadline, but you also felt that we would have some challenges ahead of us. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. It was a, a difficult budget season for us this year, uh, but we were able to pass, as you mentioned, a balanced budget with no tax increases by our, our constitutionally mandated deadline of June 30th. And so uh, some of those challenges originated from increases in pension costs, hundreds of millions of dollars in increased pension costs this year, a uh, $200 million increase because in costs because of Obamacare being implemented. So there were some really significant increases in costs and unfortunately, revenue hasn't rebounded uh, as significantly as we would like it to be. And so that's really put some pressure on the, on the state budget. But we were able to focus on priorities like education, like you mentioned. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to delve into some of those topics. We are, and uh, might as well start with education. Um, you know, recently we've heard from various sources about the drastic cuts in Pennsylvania education, but, but that's not the truth. There's been record investments. Tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, let, let's correct the record here. So, I mean, the, the first thing is that the state invested in this budget, the 2014-2015 budget, the highest amount of money for K-12 through education in the Commonwealth's history, $10.5, $10.6 billion. Uh, so, very significant. It's about 40%, just under 40% of our state budget uh, goes towards education. So clearly a top priority for the state and for the House Republican Caucus. Now, you, you mentioned those facts about uh, the $1 billion cut that we hear about all the time. Well, you know, really what they're talking about, it, it came about because of a loss of federal stimulus money. And so when you look at a, a bar chart is really the simplest way uh, to, to visualize this. And you, you see the money going up every single year from uh, state funding for education. And what happened was during the Rendell years, uh, the, the two years when he was in office and we were receiving federal stimulus money, what he did was Governor Rendell cut the state portion of education, but stacked on top of that federal stimulus money. So it still looked like overall the funding was increasing and going up. But then, as we all knew, that, that federal stimulus money was going to go away. And it did. After two years, that went away. And that dropped out. Uh, and drop down the amount of money that was there for education. And so uh, when you remove that federal piece, it looks like a, a reduction. Uh, but at the state level, we continued to increase it ever since I've been in office. Uh, we have increased those dollars every single year, and I'm proud of that record. Again, education is a top priority. I received 13 great years of schooling here in the Commonwealth uh, at our public schools in, in the district, and uh, just fantastic opportunity that we need to maintain and continue for, for all students going forward. And so we're doing that now in, the, in this year's budget, and we're, we're going to continue to do that. So the bottom line is, under a Republican-controlled legislature, this is the most money in K-12 education? That's correct. Okay. Uh, uh, the schools in the 104th legislative district, how did they fare this year? 134th, 134th. legislative district. And uh, so uh, we were able to increase funding for all those schools that are in the district. Uh, on the order roughly uh, between 6 and 10 percent. And, uh, you know, I've communicated that uh, to some members of our district via email and, and some other things. And um, some people had questions about how that, that funding was allocated for their school district. And we can provide very detailed uh, information on how the state funded uh, their school districts. If that's something that people are interested in, they, they are more than welcome to contact our office and we'll get them uh, the, all the details uh, on that funding. Now, we uh, also know that there was an increase in uh, special education funding. Uh, in terms of special education funding, and, and what other ways does this budget help people that may not be able to help themselves? Yeah, so, you know, special education is a prime example of that. 
Uh, we increased special education money by $20 million. And we started also, uh, this is a very important point, uh, we started to really change the way that special education dollars go out to different school districts. And so uh, we, we have a, a problem uh, with the way education is funded, quite honestly, uh, because of a lack of a formula. And for both special education and basic education, uh, we've started to fix that problem in, in special education. So those new dollars that went out now go out actually based on the number of students that are in school districts who have special needs and also the severity of their disability. And so uh, that's a much better way to allocate the, the dollars as opposed to uh, a rather arbitrary formula that was used previously. And so uh, the House Republic Republican Caucus is also working on uh, basic education funding formula. Again, a key point uh, that would allocate those dollars more appropriately uh, across the Commonwealth. So again, special education increased and also uh, moving those dollars out more appropriately. Uh, other areas, autism services received an increase, uh, community waivers uh, received an increase for individuals with intellectual disabilities. So a lot of good things were done in this budget and uh, really, again, that, that's another core priority is helping those in need. So education, helping those in need, public safety, all three of those things are, are top priorities for us and uh, we adequately funded those things in, in this year's budget. And you know, we often, when it comes to the budget, we talk about spending, but we will, don't want to give the impression that that's all, all that the budget is about. It's also about restraining government. And how were we able to do that this year with the budget? Sure. Well, you know, it's always a balancing act when you're you're dealing with a, a budget that has rising costs, like we talked about from pension, Obamacare, and others, uh, and then also uh, revenue pressures on revenue uh, because the economy is still recovering, unfortunately, after this long time. So it's been a, a very slow recovery uh, in some aspects, and so. Uh, those pressures, uh, you know, make it that you have to make some difficult decisions. You don't get to do everything you want to do uh, in the budget. Uh, and so we had to show some real fiscal restraint here. And uh, so it only increased uh, about 1.8% over last year. And so, again, when you look at, at our, our budget, it, it's really had to be focused on priorities uh, and those things that are, are the must-haves, as, as we consider them here in Pennsylvania. And uh, as we go forward, uh, there's no doubt there, there are going to be more difficult budgets ahead uh, because those pension obligations continue to increase every single year uh, if we don't do anything in, in terms of pension reform. What other areas benefited from the budget this year? Yeah, so uh, another area that I mentioned just uh, briefly was uh, public safety. And so we increased funding for the Attorney General's office to help uh, with drug enforcement and tobacco enforcement. Uh, we also increased money for the state police. Uh, they're going through a period where they're seeing lots of retirements. And so uh, just natural attrition in the police force has left a lot of vacancies unfilled. And so uh, we have funding in there that's going to allow for, uh, over a series of t a period of time, uh, 350 new cadets to come through and, and become uh, state police officers in the Commonwealth. So uh, that's a great thing. A lot of areas uh, in the state don't have local police because uh, of one reason or another, uh, in the 134th district, we have areas like that that receive state police coverage, uh, and so we want to make sure that they're they're appropriately covered. And uh, you did mention it briefly in regards to the pensions, as I'm sure most of our viewers know. Even though the uh, House and the Senate passed the budget on time. The governor did withhold his signature in order to try to put some pressure on the pension issue, which, which is a very important issue. Um, it wasn't able to get done by the time we recessed for the summer. Where do we stand now in regards to pension? Yeah, it, it created for some excitement here in the Capitol. Uh, <laughs> That's one way to I'm put sure, it. sure people across the Commonwealth saw that. And, uh, you know, but it is, uh, it's a great issue that the, the governor is raising, pension reform is probably, I would say, our most serious issue uh, and challenge that we face in the Commonwealth. And, and the reason for that is because of these increases, hundreds of millions of dollars every single year uh, in pension increases and contributions that have to be made, that forces you to do a couple things if, if you don't do anything about it. It's, it's going to either force you to uh, cut government services. A lot of those great things that we talked about would be crowded out by these pension increases, or it would force you to increase taxes. And when we look at taxes here in Pennsylvania, uh, we're already uh, 
the 10th highest tax state in the entire country. Uh, we have the highest corporate, uh, second highest corporate net income tax uh, next to Iowa, and that's at 9.99%. Our corporations pay uh, a significant portion of our state budget, comes from them more significant than in other states. So when you look at taxes, our businesses and, and individuals are already taxed high enough, uh, in my opinion. And so really what you have to do is reform the system. And so pension reform needs to happen. I'm a, a strong supporter of pension reform. There have been a number of proposals that have been out there and floated and discussed. Uh, the one that is out there right now, uh, it's often referred to as the Tobash Amendment. And what that is is that for new employees only, so not for current employees or existing retirees, this is for new employees only, uh, what they would do is they would be moved into a hybrid pension plan, a hybrid benefits plan. And so what that is is that instead of the, the current defined benefits plan, which we all know is unsustainable, uh, as, as demonstrated by the $50 billion unfunded liability that is in the, the pension system right now, uh, what it would do is going forward for new, those new employees, uh, the first $50,000 of their salary that would be eligible for the pensions would still go towards a pension. Uh, and, and, and that contribution. Uh, but above that, above the $50,000, uh, that portion of their salary could be used to make contributions to a 401k style plan. And so that is estimated that over 30 years uh, would save on the order, very conservative number, $6 billion. Uh, most estimates place it between 10 and $13 billion. So this is significant savings. And uh, really, again, when you look at our system, $50 billion unfunded liability, as are mentioned. We mentioned at the top of this show, our state budget is only $29 billion. So that really puts in perspective the magnitude of this problem. And while this proposal that's out there won't solve all of our problems, there's no silver bullet, though, to this problem. And so really, this is a, a good first step that should be taken, and, and hopefully uh, we're going to see some action on this. Now, at the same time, uh, there are uh, amendments that, that should be made to this uh, bill, and I have an amendment that would correct a break in service issue. There are some other uh, things that I'd like to see done with it. There are over 100 amendments that were offered to the Tobash uh, amendment that's out there. But again, we need to have this debate. We need to move forward on it, and hopefully we're going to do that uh, either later this summer or in the fall. But the bottom line is with the Tobash amendment, it essentially makes everyone the same in, in the eyes of pen, uh, the pension, correct? Well, again, so what it would do is, is it, it's starting to move towards a, a defined contribution plan. And so that's more akin to what we see in the private sector. In the private sector, only 18% of individuals today receive a defined benefit plan. So government is, is an outlier, and they're unique in that sense. And so uh, the private sector started shifting away from it a long time ago. This would be a step uh, towards that. And it, again, it's a real positive thing uh, for the Commonwealth and protecting taxpayers. At the same time, it does leave a benefit, a pension in place uh, for those individuals. And uh, you know, again, I think it's something that needs to be discussed. And uh, people who want to deny that there's a pension problem or don't want to have this debate aren't willing to face the facts. And again, the facts are that we have a $50 billion unfunded liability because of pension uh, benefit increases, because of underpayments in terms uh, of benefit contributions from the state and school districts for a series of years uh, when uh, before we came into control as, as the Republican majority now. And then also uh, just there were some economic, macroeconomic challenges uh, from downturns in the economy in the early 2000s and also 2008. And so uh, all three of those things contributed to this mess that we're in, but we have to figure out how to get out of it. All right, Representative Ryan McKenzie, thanks for joining me. I know we only have a few uh, session days left in this year, but a lot to get done. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Anthony. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm Anthony Tizak. If you have any questions about what you've just seen or any state government concerns, you can contact Representative McKenzie at his district office or through his website or Facebook. That information will appear on the screen in just a moment. Thanks for watching, and please join us again next time for another edition of Legislative Report.
Did you know that Act 16 of 1999 honors one of the greatest leaders in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives? The Matthew J. Ryan Legislative Office Building, once known as the Capitol Annex, is located next to the main Capitol building and honors the late Speaker of the House, Matthew J. Ryan. Those who visit this building will observe the magnificent architectural designs providing eloquence and grandeur to the building. Known as one of the greatest members in the history of the Pennsylvania State House, Matthew Ryan started his career in the legislature in 1963 and was elected Speaker in 1981. His charisma and knowledge will forever be reflected in the building now named after this great legislative leader. Now you know. Did you know that the chamber of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives contains a painting depicting the 24 hours of the day? Located in the center of the ceiling, the mural titled The Hours was created by artist Edwin Austin Abbey. This wonderful masterpiece charts the setting of the sun, moon, and the many stars that grace the heavens. 24 maidens, who each represent an hour of the day, begin each day in light and gladness and ends in solemn drapery carried on still shoulders. Now you know. Welcome to Legislative Report. I'm Laurie Bull. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania recently implemented a measure that would allow for veterans who received an honorable discharge to list their veteran status on their driver's license at no charge. Here to talk about this new initiative, as well as to discuss several constituent services available to residents, is State Representative Ryan McKenzie. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Laurie. Well, we're going to talk a lot today about your district office and the types of things that they can do for your constituents. First off, I guess we need to know where they're at. Can you tell us that? Sure. So we have uh, two locations that are available. Uh, one is our full-time office. It's in Emmaus. It's at the intersection of Cedarcrest and Chestnut, uh, right a couple doors down from Wally's Deli, a popular sandwich shop in town. So uh, it's in that strip mall, and uh, we're open from 9 to 5 there. And then we also have uh, office hours at Bally Borough Hall on Wednesday mornings. Uh, for residents who, who might not want to travel up to Emmaus. So two great opportunities and uh, glad we're talking about the things that our office can do to help constituents today because uh, in addition to everything that we do in Harrisburg on the legislative side, the other big service that we provide our community is what we do on the constituent service side and there's a lot we have to offer and so hopefully people are going to learn some things that they might be able to take advantage of today. Well, one of the things we're going to learn about is this new program for veterans, something I hadn't heard about. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so, you know, in the legislature, uh, we do a lot of things to honor and recognize our veterans, uh, passing different pieces of legislation that might make it easier for them to get certain benefits or, or uh, tax credits or all different things to make it more likely that they get hired in a job. So there are lots of different things we do legislatively. But uh, this was something that was passed in 2012. It was Act 176 of 2012. And so what it would do is it would allow for a special designation. It's a, a V and an American flag uh, to be placed on a Pennsylvania driver's license at no additional charge uh, for the veterans who have been honorably discharged and uh, recognizes them for their service. Uh, but it also, uh, in, in today's uh, world, we see a lot of benefits being offered by private sector businesses uh, to veterans, and that's a, a great thing. And we want to make sure that all those veterans are able to take advantage of those offers. And so uh, this would allow them to do it instead of carrying around some other additional paperwork uh, all the time. Uh, if they provide that once, uh, they could get this designation on their driver's license and then have that with them at all times. That's a great way to say thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's something that uh, what uh, veterans can do is if they are going to renew their license, they can take the proper paperwork and we have all that information on our website and our office is more than happy to help individuals uh, fill that out if, if necessary or obtain that paperwork if necessary. Uh, but also um, they can just do it when they go to renew their license. If they'd like to do that uh, in advance of a traditional renewal, uh, they would have to pay just the, the fee for a duplicate license. It's uh, about $13.50 I think is, is the amount. So not a, a large amount of money uh, if they would like to get that earlier. Otherwise, they can do it for free uh, when, they, when they go to do their traditional renewal. And certainly, your, your office would be willing to help out with any kind of uh, paperwork? or a Absolutely. Like that. That's one of the many services that we offer is assistance with PennDOT issues. And so driver's license renewals are one of those things that we can help with. Great. Well, it's that time of year again when Pennsylvanians age 65 and older uh, 
can file for property tax rent rebate. It's a program that's been around for a long time. It helps seniors with their property taxes, which are ever escalating. Um, but there's probably some seniors out there that maybe aren't aware of the program or maybe are intimidated about what it might take to get involved. Can you talk about that program? Sure. So the, the property tax and rent rebate program is one of our most popular uh, services that we offer in, in the uh, district office. And so as you said, uh, property taxes are ever increasing and uh, especially for seniors who are on a fixed income or a reduced income uh, after they've retired, uh, it's a, a very challenging situation that they're in. And so uh, these uh, rebates and, and reductions in their tax bill are uh, they're funded through the gaming uh, revenues and so in this case uh, you have to meet certain income requirements um, you have to meet certain age requirements and eligibility requirements all of that information is also available on our website um, and I would encourage individuals to check it out uh, see if they do comply a lot of people uh, aren't familiar with the program and then uh, even if they've maybe heard about it they haven't actually checked it out themselves and and when they do they're they're pleasantly surprised sometimes again uh, typically uh, you might get a couple hundred dollars off uh, if you're or in a rebate uh, if you are eligible and the maximum is six hundred fifty dollars but uh, it's certainly something worth looking into it doesn't take very long uh, again you can contact our office we can help you see if you meet the requirements there um, I've heard some some uh, advertisements or about groups offering to help prepare these applications for a fee. What's sure. the deal and with that? And so, uh, you know, it's not a scam. It's a, it's, they're legitimate businesses, but um, I would encourage individuals to contact our office. We do that service free of charge. Um, so as opposed to uh, paying somebody uh, outside to help you prepare the paperwork uh, to see if you are eligible for the rebate, uh, we can do that for free in our office. So that's uh, obviously uh, a better way to do it. And we'll make sure that the, the paperwork is handled properly and carefully. All of your uh, vital information, your personal information would be obviously pr protected and secure. Uh, so certainly I think a, a much better opportunity to come into our office and always happy to help and uh, again we uh, also go out in the community uh, you know we go out to a lot of senior uh, residences and living communities and okay. help them uh, fill out the paperwork people are very grateful for the the rebates that they do receive so anybody who hasn't had the opportunity to look into that program should certainly again contact our office that sounds great let's move on to a few other services um, what involving PennDOT might a person be able to accomplish when they come to your office? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, PennDOT, uh, all of the typical things, uh, like we talked about with uh, licenses, but registration, um, changes of, uh, of address, uh, notary work we can do in our offices, uh, so any of the, the vehicle registrations and, and paperwork uh, that goes along with transferring tags and things like that, we can help uh, do uh, get all the paperwork prepared and ready for you there. So uh, please, you know, stop in any of those PennDOT issues. Uh, there are uh, locations in the Lehigh Valley where you can go uh, to receive those services. But again, we can help uh, with a lot of those things uh, for free of charge in our office. Certainly, I imagine many people come to you if they're having trouble working through an agency like PennDOT on their own or, or another state agency. I would imagine you can be a, a good a uh, conduit for that. Absolutely, you know, that's one of the things that I enjoy doing most in, in my government service is uh, helping people navigate the maze of government. Uh, you know, while we're working legislatively uh, on a lot of things to try and streamline government, make it more simple and efficient for people, uh, at the same time, we still deal with the bureaucracy. I go through it myself just like everybody else does. And uh, so at any time, if you're having problems with, uh, whether it be PennDOT or any state agency, mm -hmm. Um, certainly contact our office. We're always happy to help and we've gotten some good results for constituents uh, since I've been in office helping them solve their problems and also uh, fix those problems. Sometimes when people bring to us uh, a problem that they're facing, a lot of other people are facing it as well. It helps raise the issue for us and then we can actually go about fixing the problem uh, instead of just dealing with that bureaucracy. So uh, certainly would encourage anybody who has uh, an issue with any state agency uh, to reach out to us. While I don't want to discourage people from contacting you, sometimes there are things that you would just have to refer on, such sure. as a federal issue. Can you talk about a few of those things that you might hear fairly often that you end up just kind of having to move on yeah. maybe to a congressman or? A absolutely. So, you know, it is really important to understand the different roles of, of different levels of government. Um, so certainly we, we do hear a number of issues that are really local government in nature. 
Um, you know, so anything uh, dealing with uh, municipal sewer or, or waste or trash, things like that, uh, those go to the local level. Um, you know, federal level issues that we often hear about and we, we do redirect to uh, our U.S. congressmen and senators are things like social security, um, immigration issues, uh, anything like that would really go to those offices. Um, and then at the same time, the other things uh, that we hear about, um, which oftentimes we do redirect, are uh, issues of, of uh, legal matters. And so uh, whether it be uh, in child support cases or uh, criminal cases, uh, we will often refer those to the appropriate court or uh, the attorney general or uh, district attorney in Lehigh County, uh, whoever the proper, proper legal or, or criminal uh, division would be, we often hand cases off to them directly instead of dealing with those in our office. I have a laundry list here of a few other things, <laughs> and I'm sure there's more that's not on this list, but applications for birth and death certificates, uh, providing Pennsylvania child abuse history clearance applications, uh, criminal history applications, uh, Pennsylvania tax forms as well. And also, I'm sure you have, uh, like most representatives do, a, a rack full of brochures of all various programs and things that are available. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we actually see fairly often is uh, families coming in. Uh, and they're often either picking up uh, information to learn about Pennsylvania history or government in general. Uh, and then also uh, families with some older children are coming in and picking up uh, brochures and, and pamphlets about driving and uh, learning to pass the driving test. So uh, we often see families come in. Always happy to meet with students. Uh, just last week I met with a couple of students who were doing a school project on government, uh, had some great questions about voting in government. So always happy to help uh, families and, and students as well. Uh, the other group that often comes into our office is seniors, right. um, again with PACENET or, or PACE applications, property tax and rent rebate, which we talked about. Uh, there are a lot of programs which are out there available for seniors uh, to help them and uh, always happy to help them as well. And also, let's not forget our college students, FIA and uh, information as well in yep. your office. Oh, yeah, it's that time of year, and so we've already had uh, some folks come in and uh, start filling out their paperwork for FIA and uh, college financial aid uh, here at the state level. And so great opportunities, uh, just sometimes you have to look a little bit. And yeah. so uh, we'll help point you in the right direction if you come into our office. Sounds great. Before we wrap up today, there's an issue that's gotten an awful lot of uh, headlines. People are getting surprises when they open their, their electricity bill. There's some, been some rate spikes for people that have um, variable rate uh, providers. Could you talk a little bit about that problem and what is the House doing to address that problem? Right. So uh, this issue, this is one of the things that does or has come up recently in our office from a number of constituents. And so it relates to uh, energy prices. And so in our market here in Pennsylvania, we do have the option for consumers to go out and shop for their electricity. Uh, they also have the option to stay on their default service, something like PPNL uh, in our area. Uh, but if you go out and shop, you can sometimes find some, some great deals, uh, some lower costs uh, on the energy that would be supplied to you. Uh, at the same time, those contracts are often variable in nature. Uh, they have some other clauses to them. Maybe uh, if you want to exit the contract earlier, there might be a fee. Uh, so there are some things that you really have to look at. And uh, I think it's, you know, uh, buyer beware, uh, just in the sense that uh, you can find some good deals, but you have to be careful and really read the fine print about what you're getting into. And so in, in this case, uh, those variable contracts, uh, because of the cold uh, winter that we've had, the cost of energy had gone up. Uh, the variable rates obviously went up and some people had some pretty big sticker shock when they saw their yeah. bills come in. And so uh, right now the House is looking into that. Uh, also the Attorney General is looking into it. And so uh, if you do have a complaint, you can file it with the Attorney General's office or the PUC. Uh, their information will be on the screen and uh, I would encourage uh, residents to reach out to them if they feel that uh, there was something uh, improperly uh, handled with their electricity bill. And certainly the Attorney General would, a general would be a little bit different. Uh, that's if you feel that they've violated some unfair trade practices. That sure. You could so, go to the attorney you know, um, the House is certainly looking into just the uh, price fluctuations and, and how that uh, is being handled in Pennsylvania and if it's the best thing for consumers. And as you said, the attorney general would really get involved if you feel like there was, a, again, a misrepresentation uh, in your contract or a, a breach of the contract by the energy supplier. 
Okay. Thanks for all that information, a wealth of information for your constituents, and hopefully, uh, you know, people will, will uh, flood the doors. Absolutely. <laughs> and keep it was you very a, busy. a lot of information we provided. So if anybody has any questions on any of the things we talked about today or any other state issues, uh, please contact our office. We're always happy to help. Thank you so much. And that is all the time we have for today's program. As Representative McKenzie said, if you need assistance with any state matter, please feel free to contact him at one of his local offices or even through his website. That information will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching Legislative Report.